Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program here on this fourth day of August. Um, today, I have a special guest who um, has popped in to join us. Uh, Karen Mojica is from Hernando County Mosquito Control. I think she has, um, for the past few months, had some mosquitoes clogged up in her computer or something because she has issues of popping in and out. So. In the interest of hoping um, her technology will cooperate, um, I'm going to let Karen um, have a little short announcement before we start looking at these pretty plants because, Karen, we've been getting an awful lot of rain lately, haven't we? Yes. Yes. So, we uh, have. What does, yeah, what does mosquito control have to tell us about um, dealing with okay. all the rain? Well, we've been getting a lot of calls out for a lot of the standing water that's been throughout the county the last couple of weeks. Um, we don't just send our trucks out. That seems to be um, miscommunication that uh, everyone's just waiting for the trucks. Um, when they're standing water, spraying with a truck doesn't really help uh, solve the problem. Um, there are times we do need to send the truck, but we do need to send our technicians out there first to treat those water areas. Um, there are biological products or larvicides that we can use um, that will stop those mosquitoes from hatching from those uh, swampy areas that we've now gotten. So if you're having a problem, even if it's not standing water, first, of course, you want to make sure that you're not breeding your own mosquitoes by bottoms of flower pots, um, filled bird baths, things of that sort. So first you wanna go around your yard, make sure all your smaller art articles are dumped. Um, that will eliminate them from hatching at that point. The larger bodies, we can come out and we can do a treatment for you. So you can go to our website, our Facebook page. You can give us a call. I'll put the phone number down on the chat and give us a call. Our guys will be more than happy to come out They'll look for the source of the breeding. Um, mosquitoes do need water in order to breed. They will lay their eggs in or on around water. Um, once that water's there, they live like, like fish in a sense for the first five, seven days. Um, they live totally in water. So if you eliminate the water or treat the water, it will eliminate them from hatching. Um, we've gotten a lot of people that are having a lot of mosquito issues due to a large, large amount of water. So give us a call and we'll be more than happy to send our guys out there and take care of this for you. Um, remember we are here, that is our job here. Uh, we are county government. And what is so your phone number, Karen? The phone number, I'll say it here and then I'll type it in. It's 352-540-6552. And like I said, you can also go on our webpage or our Facebook page. And you can put a request in yourself or give me a call. I'll be happy to do it for you. Okay. Thank you very much. And that really you're does, awesome. even if you're not listening or if you're listening from somewhere other than Hernando County, your mosquito control um, department in your county is probably going to give you the same information. Um, you know, it is a, uh, you know, probably a federal law now that you can't just send the truck out willy-nilly. You have to justify the reasons and you have to send them out when it, it'll do the most good. And as yes. you said, when there's standing water, that's not the time that it will do the most good. But that doesn't mean you ignore the situation. You have other ways that you deal with those situations, like you said, larvicides. Sometimes if you're going to have standing water for quite some time, you even um, put in Oh, there she goes. You even put in uh, mosquito fish, as long as yeah. it's you know not a short-term thing where the, the fish will end up dying. So there's many things that mosquito control can do. The first thing that you can do is go out in your yard, look where there's standing water in those places you never thought to look before, even tarps on your grill, tarps on your boat, things like that, and you know do the first steps. Then, if there's still a problem, contact your mosquito control um, department and you know see what they can do to help you out, to help you find the source, and to take care of it. So, thank you very much, Karen, uh, for all that you do. And 
I guess I'm going to get started now. We're here today to talk about pretty plants. We, we put off this talk a month ago because a storm was coming. So we talked about trees instead. But let's talk about the pretty plants that beat the heat. Yes, it's August, but we still have a couple months of some pretty hot weather um, ahead of us. So let's talk about a few of the plants, certainly not all of them, but a few of them that are gonna be very um, good performers for you in your yard during these hot times. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities in water conservation. The program that I utilize to teach that is Florida Friendly Landscaping. And it is, um, it is what I use to teach and this water conservation, there are nine principles in that, which I will show you in a second. And if you would like to email me, if you have any questions, if you'd like a PDF copy of this program, it is being recorded. It'll be on Facebook this afternoon. It'll be on Hernando County Government YouTube in a few days. And therefore you can catch it again, but also a lot of people like things in writing. So if you want a PDF, copy of this so you can look at it and have the names of the plants and the Latin names and all of that, email me at lily b, l i l l y b at hernandocounty.us. Here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. One we're gonna cover uh, pretty heavily today is that number one, right plant, right place. So speaking of right plant, right place, the first thing we need to think about is where is our horticultural zone? What horticultural zone are we in? The USDA has created these zones based on the average um, high temperatures and the average low temperatures. Helps you um, kind of have a basis to know what kind of plants are gonna grow in your area. So here, if you're listening from Hernando County, that's where we are. Here's Hernando County squarely in 9A, zone 9A. So what does that mean? I hear a lot of times people tell me, my friend in Newport Ritchie, my friend in Newport Ritchie, they can grow this kind of plant and it always freezes up here. But look at this Southwestern area here of Pasco County. They're kind of on the edge of 9B. So they can get away with a little more of the tropical type plants than we can. Things are getting warmer. There's really no doubt about that. So if you want to experiment, knowing that you're experimenting, I wouldn't experiment with a thousand dollar tree, but three, four dollar plants, you know, you want to experiment with them. I would definitely, you know, experiment in things that maybe are zoned for 9B rather than, you know, higher up. You can get plants that grow in zone 11, 10B, 10A, but most likely you will lose them in our winters. So that's the first step to look for. Then the next step is to make a plan. Um, how do we do that? We just, you know, and all of us, including me, are guilty of not <laughs> planning very well. You go to the store, you find what's pretty, and you choose that. Well, we need to get past finding what's pretty. Um, we wouldn't choose that, you know, in a life partner. So perhaps we should <laughs> alone in a life partner. So that maybe, you know, we think along the same lines with our plants that are going to be partners in our yard with us. Um, so that, there we go. <laughs> um, so that we have a good successful yard. And don't just wait, you know, just choose what's pretty because it may not work out in your site conditions or even in our area. And you wanna check what kind of space do, we, do you have? We all are kind of um, guilty and I'm the same thing, a buying first and then deciding later, where am I gonna put it? But eventually you're probably gonna run out of space and, um, you know, despite not only how much space do you have, how much effort do you want to put into maintaining it? And that is a big thing. Don't impulse buy. Think about 
um, you know, because all plants do require some effort, a lot of weeding mainly. So think about that. Research exactly what you want to get. You're doing that here by watching this class. You can also get a hold of, behind me I have a, uh, this book, this Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Plant Guide and Guide to Plant Design. You can find this in person, you can uh, find this online, and there's a, even a web or a, a web tool that you can use on your phone to find that information as well. If you want to find out how to do that, um, give me a call, 352-540-6230, uh, or again, email me, and I'll let you know the various ways you can get a hold of that book, and it's free. But the thing is, you want to plan before you plant. And we're all kind of guilty of not doing that, but that is going to guarantee the most success. Planning before planting. And speaking of planting, it's very important, the actual act of how you plant something um, is very, very important because you can get the best plant in the world that works for your site conditions, that you know is for your zone. Um, it'd be great in that area. But if you don't plan it correctly, you could still end up with a failure. So we're just going to go very quickly because that could be a whole class in itself. But these diagrams really do help. What most people do wrong when they do it wrong is that they plan it too low. Um, you want that the um, how the plant came out of the pot. You want the soil that was in the pot exposed. You don't want to try and bury that down. That's one major thing to think of. You can add some compost or organic matter to the soil. Adding actual fertilizer is useless and a waste of your money. Um, you want that hole dug wider, a little bit wider. This is a little wider, really two to three times wider, but no deeper than the pot. Water well before and after planting. What I do a lot of times is, you know, it's Florida, we're very sandy. I'll go ahead and fill up that hole with water. By the time I set the plant in it, you know, that water is pretty much sucked up by either the sand or the, the potting soil from the plant I put in there. But again, don't bury that plant too deep. The only plant you can get away with actually covering up a good part of its stem is a tomato. So, you know, our uh, landscape plants, make sure that top part that it came out of the pot is exposed. You don't even want to cover it yet with mulch because you want it to be able to water, get watered in well. So let's go ahead and start looking at the pretty plants. Let's get right into that. I'm going to start with native plants. And I think you'll see a pattern here once I break away a little bit from the native plants. But let's talk about plants that are native. And when I say native, people look for loopholes all the time lately. And to me, native is pretty self-explanatory. I, when I hear native plant, I think native to the region where I live. But I've known people um, we're trying to expand that. And some of the native plant, um, like Facebook groups I watch, and they may be, they're just native plants. So people will show you, this is, I'm in Minnesota, this is native to Minnesota, la la la. But then there are people saying, well, it's native to the United States. That's not gonna work out well for you if you take you know that kind of broad um, look at it. Florida, it's a whole lot different than the United States in general. Uh, Central Florida is different than North Florida, definitely different than South Florida. So when we say native plants, they mean native to the region where you live. So let's, these all are <laughs> good for Central Florida. Beach sunflower, this is a really great plant, very, um, low maintenance. In the summer, it does tend to be a bit of a spreader. I have it um, in, the, in the front and at least once or twice every summer, I'm having to cut parts of it off of my sidewalk. 
which I think you know is a good thing. It spreads very well. Uh, it gets one to three feet tall, is covered in these little yellow flowers that are about the size of a 50 cent piece. Um, it is a self spreader. It doesn't like you to spread it. It's, it's, it is a free spirit. It wants to go where it wants to go. It's not really very cooperative in where you want it to go. Now I bought it, I'm sure from the Hernando County Master Gardener's Nursery years ago. And if you do buy it in pots and plant it, it does well. But if I have not been successful transplanting it, very successful transplanting it anyway, just a few times has it ever worked. And it has worked when I have tried and when I've um, taken some of it and put it in a pot. And when I say that, I put some in a pot. Um, doesn't really like pots because it's, well, it doesn't like all this rain either. It tends to kind of get black along the roots and the stems as the summer goes on. Never fully dies out, but it gets kind of black and it kind of gets droopy and blah. So I was successful one year with one in a pot <clears throat> until about this time of year when it's kind of decided, no, I'm done and got all black stem. But ever since then, it grows by itself beside that pot because <laughs> it's just that, um, rebellious, that free spirited, okay, I'm not gonna grow there, but I will grow here. I'll grow where I wanna grow. I want it to be my idea. I do love this plant um, and what I've learned from it, see, I, it says here, it attracts or it likes dry nutrient poor areas. Dry, which is good for those of us who live up in uh, the Northwestern part of Hernando County, very dry soil there. Its name is beach sunflower. Its name is June sunflower. That's the other name for it. You can find it on the beaches. If you go over to the East Coast, they use it quite a bit on the dunes and everything for stabilization. Um, as I said, I had it in my front bed and I still have some, but over the years, it's not as plentiful because I mulch the front beds. Um, you know, other plants get in there. The soil's getting too nice for the beach sunflower. So just keep that in mind. It likes dry, sandy, like um, very nutrient poor soil. And it does attract butterflies, bees, and birds. This is one of my favorite natives, um, sometimes called spotted horse mint, sometimes called bee balm. It grows naturally in the area where I live. Um, I've been, I, I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but I've been trying to collect some seeds when, when the flowers are done because there's a lot of home building going on in my area. So the areas where these bee bomb grew naturally, now there are houses on top of a lot of them. So I'm trying to save some of them. Um, they look very, very interesting up close. From far away, if you see one or two, you'll overlook it and think it's a weed. But you know, look very closely how intricate. And the bees do absolutely love this, as well do all, you know, all kinds of pollinators. And it, again, it likes dry soil. Um, a lot of these you'll find out that are good for blooming in the hot summer. They like dry soil that kind of, you know, that's how they withstand all the heat. And these are good in full to partial sun. And I just think they're, they're beautiful. And you can find a lot of these native plants that I'm referring to um, from a native plant nursery. A lot of native plants are, when we talk about native plants, I warn people that they're not easy to come across. You have to make an effort to do it. You can't walk into a big box store and just easily pick them up on a Saturday. But there is, you can look up um, F-A-N-N, Florida Association of Native Nurseries .org, um, to find a native nursery near you. And they'll be, the native nursery people love to help you out and hook you up with native plants. This one um, is easy to find in some of the even non-native or not exclusively native um, 
local nurseries such as the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery, which I'll tell you where that is, as well as the Nature Coast Botanical Gardens Nursery. You can find a lot of these plants there. At the end, I'll tell you um, where you can find those. Starlet sage um, or salvia, it's self-spreading. It likes dry to partially moist soil and full sun. Looks great in mass. Um, and especially then, you know, if it grows well, it will continue uh, to keep growing. And it does attract, obviously it attracts butterflies. I caught this one um, on the scarlet sage. Bees, birds, it does bloom all year, but here in central Florida, um, it will freeze back. But usually it makes a comeback pretty well. I have it mixed in with um, some of that beach sunflower um, and other non-native salvias of different colors. The red and the, there's a pink one that's a native as well. Um, they look really nice all together there. They're growing where that beach sunflower is kind of, kind of uh, petering out. Now, I added this with the natives, this poor, poor, poor blanket flower. <laughs> I feel sorry for blanket flower. Um, isn't it gorgeous? I just love blanket flower or galardia. Absolutely gorgeous. Spreads very, very, very well. Why do I feel sorry for it? Because it's been plutoized. It's been kicked off the native plant team. <laughs> I mean, the poor flower. <laughs> because uh, due to carbon dating, however they do it, they've determined it was not here, not this particular type, not this really big, you know, um, brilliant, beautiful. Um, there's a different ecotype that was here, but the ones we're used to were not here in 1513. They kind of used that guideline when Ponce de Leon got here what was here, <laughs> we're gonna call that native. So if you have a native garden, and you have Gallardia in it, please don't pull it out. It's such a wonderful wildflower. Even though it's not officially a native plant, I think we should still include it in our butterfly gardens. <laughs> um, it's certainly not a harmful plant. So, even though it's been kicked off the native plant team. Um, I've actually been buying some since then because I feel sorry for it. So um, great plant spreads, makes a beautiful meadow looking uh, plant, um, has that nice open face so that pollinators can land on it. Um, you know, bees and one of the things that do that. Um, I know these are available at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery, probably other places as well. And these will keep making a comeback for you year after year. They do have a high drought, drought tolerance as well. Black-eyed Susans. These are ones you kind of need to be careful of because we don't have native black-eyed Susans. But since black-eyed Susans are native pretty much all over the country, the, um, you might think it's okay to order it from Michigan or Ohio or someplace like that. Those are different ecotypes. So if you're, you know, want the most success, you're going to try and find the ones specific to our region. And even in that, there's different types. That's why I just put um, Rubeckia because it's, there's whole different varieties um, of black eyed Susans. The one that's most commonly used, like in the landscape, is Rubeckia hirta, H I R T A. I don't think this picture is of that variety because I took this basically out in the woods. So this is kind of a wild growing variety of black eye Susans, but they're gorgeous and they attract butterflies, birds and bees. Great to have and add in your wildflower garden. All right. <laughs> This could be a class in itself. The milkweed, the sclapheas. Um, I'm trying to say this in a, a truncated uh, version. We want to avoid 
the tropical milkweed, the ones you'll find when you walk in the big box store, that is Asclepius cursivaca. Um, C-U-R-R goes on from there. Asclepius cursivaca is the tropical milkweed. And it seems like every week I hear another potential issue with the tropical milkweed. Number one, it does not die back like our native milkweeds. Therefore, you trick the monarchs into staying here longer than they should. So then they have the potential of freezing to death or not finding food. That's one thing. There is a parasite that each monarch carries on its body just naturally. This, um, overabundance of the tropical milkweed discourages social distancing. We know all about that now, don't we? Therefore, the parasite, um, there's more butterflies around, so there's more parasite around, and the parasite leads to the death of the caterpillars. It is becoming potentially invasive. And the last thing is, all milkweeds have a toxin in them that makes, you know, helps protect the butterflies because they have these little bit of toxins so that prey doesn't want to eat them. But with so much of it, they can ingest above the threshold of toxin and therefore actually start poisoning themselves. Therefore, that's all of the, you know, like I said, every week I'm hearing not so great things about Asclepius cursivaca. In the meantime, we have 21 native milkweeds in Florida. Unfortunately, only three of those 21 have had commercial success. And that would be the tuberosa, this pretty orange one. And then there's a pink one and a white one. These are both swamp um, milkweed. So you need a wet area for these. This picture here is a wonderful native as well, taken by one of our master gardeners, the Asclepius humistrata. They're working on trying to get this to be available commercially. You know, the, the, the breeders have issues. You gotta be real careful. You, you know, don't want to um, damage the milkweeds that are out in the wild. So there's only so many you can experiment with and then have them be successful in a way to have enough to sell to people is what the issue is. <clears throat> so far they have done that with these three, but they're working on more. And um, so you can find those in the native plant nurseries or possibly some of the you know privately owned nurseries around. Another thing you have to be careful with the milkweed they may have in the big box store is if it um, has been exposed at all to any kind of pesticides around it, because that could be very, very, very detrimental to your butterflies. So <laughs> I think that was a nice short talk about the milkweed issue. Here's one of my favorites, uh, firebush. If you want the native you got to make sure it's a Hemilia patens. Um, and what I have heard is it's a little bit hard to tell the difference between a non-native fire, fire bush, which is hybrid, and, and the um, native fire bush. It's hard for us to tell the difference. It's not hard for the butterflies and the hummingbirds to tell the difference. They just don't frequent um, the non-native one near as much as the native ones. So if that is your intent, you want to try and get this native one. It's going to grow pretty tall into a bush. And, um, and you know, red tubular flowers, what you're going to get, you're going to get those hummingbirds coming to you. They are cold sensitive. So you can't really rely on them to be like for screening, to be a year round type of bush that will always be there. But even if they get hit by the cold, they seem to always make a comeback as well. It's just one of my favorite, very nice, very nice plants. Very um, easily propagated, it seems like, too. Passion vine, one of our favorites. 
it's just so funky looking <laughs> these these passion flowers this is the purple passion um, vine passiflora incarnata Passion vines are another thing you need to take care, be careful with that you get one of the natives because some of the non-natives, the twin flowers, the two little red and yellow ones are becoming invasive. You may be saying, well, this purple passion vine is pretty invasive <laughs> as well. It's aggressive, it's an aggressive grower, um, but because it's native, we say it's pioneering. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never going to um, disrupt a native ecosystem, even as much as it likes to grow. I've seen it growing like a weed, you know, in various places. But where I happen to live, I have trouble getting it really to grow much at all. Um, body growing a little bit right now, but I have several issues. I guess the really sandy soil, although I've seen it growing in, in really sandy soil. My biggest issue is I need to get some and grow it really large in a pot in, in my spring porch till I put it outside. Because the second I put it outside, the critters are so happy to see it. They start eating it up and they don't ever let it get very big. And by critters, I do mean the caterpillars of the Gulf fritillaria and the zebra long ring, but I also mean my gopher tortoise. Loves to just eat its head right, right off which to me, that's what it's there for. But I would like the vine to be able to grow a little. So that is my next step is to get some more and don't put it out until there's enough at the buffet, at the buffet for everyone to enjoy. There's another native passion vine um, that I keep hearing about, people talking about, they get really excited talking about the corky stem passion vine. It does not have these big gregarious flowers that looks like Dr. Seuss drew them. Um, it doesn't really have much of a flower at all. I mean, maybe this, like this part here is all you'll really see on the corky stem, but the caterpillars absolutely love it. So if that's what you're going for, you know, consider getting also a corky stem passion vine. Chickseed is our state wildflower. Coreopsis, and I put Coreopsis um, spa, that means various species, um, because there are different types um, out there. The one that is used, sold by seed, um, you know, to plant in your yard is usually the Leavenworthi um, variety. And you may say, well, uh, that sounds like Kansas to, to me, um, just where it was I identified. Um, and so there are different subspecies, so they may not have petals exactly like this. I have had very good success with uh, chick seed. And it's called that because look at, you know, the, the little seeds when they turn black look like ticks. There is nothing about this flower that attracts ticks, so don't worry about that. Or just call it Coreopsis in front of your friends and you know, they won't get worried. Um, I have it growing from seed. I have it from where I bought it at um, various nurseries. And it's all, you know, growing pretty well in my yard. Just a nice little wildflower to have there. Now here's one um, that is much more of a bush. And according to the Florida Friendly Plant Guide, they don't have it as attracting any particular kind of animals. What it will do though, um, even if it doesn't attract them for food. This is a great shelter for various type of uh, wildlife to hide in. The oak leaf hydrangea, I mean, the leaves themselves are very, hold a lot of interest. And then you get these nice, they're gonna be white flowers. <laughs> we don't, this is our only native hydrangea. Um, and it gets pretty big. Something about it, I don't know what, something about the bush itself and the leaves and the way it grows very well in the shade reminds me of a mountain laurel or a rhododendron, kind of gives you that feel. And I really like um, this nice bush as well. And it must be native, like I said, there's different ecotypes, but I saw a whole 
a raised planter growing of um, oak leaf hydrangea at Monticello in Virginia at Thomas Jefferson's home place. So, you know, must be native all up and down the coast, but it's a great, great plant to have and to add to your garden, especially if you have shady areas and you're not sure what to put there. This says, and the book says, full to partial sun and shade. I would go more towards that shade for this plant. Okay, let's just talk about perennials. We have um, left, we have left the first section, which was purely native. So now all these plants are not native, but they are Florida friendly. That means they're well-behaved non-natives. <laughs> I happen to have this, um, I'm not sure what to, to even call it, but I have found you know, that they do talk about black and blue sage. So that is definitely what this is. And I got it from the Master Gardener Nursery. These calyxes are so dark purple, they're, they look black. And then the flower is actually a little bit more darker purple, you know, violet than this. Really cool, and it will bloom like through Halloween. So I have actually added it to um, a program I did about spooky plants, you know, about great plants to have for a Halloween look as well, because usually by then it's still standing and it has dumped a lot of the, the actual flowers. So it still, it has those black calyx, it looks really neat. Um, I, I picked up another plant um, that they were calling Mexican sage. I found it online, Salvia leucantha. Let me tell you the pollinators, especially the bumblebees. And Brenda took this picture also of hers with a bumblebee on it. I couldn't get my bumblebees to behave and, and let me take their picture. So Brenda <laughs> was able to do that. Um, they just love this plant. And it's doing okay with all this rain, but it seemed to thrive, was even happier. All through May, when we had zero rain, this plant looked fantastic. And it seemed, it almost gets pretty bush-like. These kind are just gonna be tall sticks, you know, that look really good in mass, but this really spreads out like a bush. And like I said, all kind of pollinators, particularly the bumblebees, will be all over that. Uh, Balbine comes in yellow like this. I don't know what these red things are in this photo. It's not part of the plant, at least not part of this plant. Um, this is kind of almost like a succulent, so it does very, very well in, um, you know, it's a drought tolerant type plant. And you can also get it in orange as well as this yellow. It sends up these spikes with these pretty yellow or orange flowers on it and makes a great um, ground cover. Here's one of my favorites, one of my favorite non-natives anyway. Some people tend to think that this is a native, but it is not. The firecracker plant. I have a close-up of it here so you can see the red tubular flowers. And what are we going to get with red tubular flowers? That's right, we're going to get our hummingbirds, as well as butterflies and other pollinators. Um, Generally, it makes nice little, almost like little bushes. Um, and this is well used in like commercial landscapes as well. It can get three to four feet tall, like a mounding weeping bush um, and two to four feet wide. So it fills in spaces really well. And once they get established, <clears throat> you, can, uh, you can almost ignore them if you want to. And they're going to be, you know, pretty, pretty happy there. Here's just this just screams Florida to you, doesn't it? This screams like your grandmother's house <laughs> in Florida. These canna lilies and these come in. That's why I have again canna spa. Means varying species of um, it's the canna species. There's various varieties within it. Um, so you can find them just in red, you can find them in white, you can find them in these multicolors here. Um, great plant that probably will freeze in our winters here. But again, you, you cut back the, the old frozen stuff, you know, mid-March, sometime around then, 
and it's gonna come right back and look beautiful for you. Um, and it attracts butterflies and bees and all kinds of great pollinators and uh, makes great hiding places for other little critters as well. This one I really like, might be kind of hard to find. Um, I know the extension office used to have one. Um, the only issue with this is it doesn't really like a lot of our heavy rains. It kind of gets kind of sad looking, but then it pops back in the fall and in the spring. Um, Texas sage. So with those two words, you know it likes it dry. Leucophyllum pretensis, this means white leaves. And it is kind of silvery green, greenish white. <laughs> and um, the Florida friendly hand guide does not mention it attracting, well, they only really talk about uh, butterflies or birds. Hopefully you know, it's being revised. They're also going to be talking about other pollinators. But obviously, you know, they captured a picture right there of, of a pollinator on this plant. And it, it gets pretty tall. It's just three to five feet tall. I think I remember it being taller than me. So it might, you know, get even six feet tall if you let it and gets pretty wide. So you can use this as a bush. If you have a place that is just dry and sandy and nothing else really seems to grow, I would try out this, this Texas sage. Here's our old standard, the crepe myrtles. And again, you know, there are so many different um, varieties of crepe myrtle and they're, you know, working on them all the time to bring new varieties that are more beautiful. Um, just remember with the crepe myrtle, if you want a small tree and not fight with it and not prune it to where it is overly pruned and unhealthy for the plant, then you got to get a dwarf variety. This goes back to right plant, right place. And a few weeks ago, I was kind of picking on crepe myrtles because I just came back from coastal Virginia. And I mean, you can't turn a circle <laughs> without seeing crepe myrtles up there. I love crepe myrtles. Nothing wrong with them, but they attract some birds and they definitely provide shelter and structure and all that. But they're like compared to a native wax myrtle, a native oak tree, which are each going to attract hundreds of, you know, different types of um, insects and birds and caterpillars and all that. The crepe myrtle is not a big wildlife attractor. It is pretty. And, and that's fine, you know, to have it there for your pop of color. But the reason I was picking on it is because I just I would think they are in danger of it becoming a monoculture for one thing. So if one gets a disease, then, you know, so many trees in their, in their area are going to be wiped out. But also because there are other choices which are going to bring a lot more benefit to our pollinators. So, and speaking in, of, of just absolutely pretty, makes you think of Florida, hibiscus, the various types of hibiscus. Um, again, it does say, yes, it attracts some butterflies. And I took this picture of this bee in here. So obviously um, it attracts bees as well. Um, hibiscus, they don't like to be too dry. They don't like to be too wet. Both um, situations will cause the leaves to yellow and you may not know why. Also, they, they can be cold sensitive. So just, you know, don't spend a lot of money on them, but you can get them and enjoy them for their beautiful big flowers um, and for that nice pop of color. And they come in so many different colors and kinds now. Okay, we went from natives to different perennials non-native perennials. Let's talk about annuals. And this might be a time to consider for your annuals um, container gardening. And this isn't a class where I'm going to explain a lot about container gardening because I'm going to have that class coming up <laughs> um, with tiny gardens, big impact. But 
what I would like to say about annuals is they're fun. And again, they bring that pop of color. So when I say use annuals to accessorize, what do I mean by that is that have your base, you know, your yard, your perennials, you know, everything that your yard always is, and then bring in small areas if you want to do annuals that you change out often. It's like the jewelry of the yard. <laughs> so that's why I say you use it to accessorize. A lot of annuals are not going to bring you, you know, um, a lot of pollinators. Some will, but that's not the job really of annuals. You want to rely on your perennials and your trees and your shrubs and, you know, what you have going on the rest of your yard for that. And that's why I suggest containers, because if you want to have fun switching out annuals with the seasons, concentrate that to a small area. For one thing, why buy new plants every season unless it's just something you want to do for fun. But for your whole yard, that would be, you know, ultra expensive. And as well as, you know, your carbon footprint, somebody's driving these plants all over the country. So keep that in mind as well. That's why, you know, have fun with the annuals, but maybe kind of limit them, use them to accessorize your yard. And the reason why a lot of them are not great um, pollinator attractors is so that they look beautiful, so that you are attracted to them and purchase them. And so that they're not a pain with various pests, people have worked on hybridizing them over the years um, to get you know, what you have now. The, and that's great you know, for what you're looking for. But what has happened with this is we have hybridized a lot of these plants way faster than evolution can keep up with us. What does that mean? That means your insects have not evolved with that plant that we sent into the fast track of hybridization. Therefore, they do not recognize it as a plant. That now, some they do. And it doesn't mean you'll never see an insect or a butterfly that might ha happen to stop by you know, one of these plants. But in general, some of them are not high um, pollinator attractors. If you're looking for those, you want your natives, number one, or even some of your um, non-native perennials. Having said that, let's move to these natives. Having said that, the zinnia now is probably going to get you some nice, um, you know, some nice pollinators. Butterflies, bees, and birds has that nice flat landing area for them. But they also, as far as I know, you know, if you get zinnias, you probably are going to have pretty close to the zinnias your grandmother had, so or your great grandmother. So that's why they're still, you know, pretty nice um, annuals to have. One of the native plant groups that I watch on Facebook, somebody, you know, wanted to show off their whole bed of zinnias. Oh, <laughs> they're beautiful, but you know. Don't do that to native plant people because <laughs> you will get uh, schooled. Um, so they suggested, you know, maybe show those off in another uh, gardening group that is not a native plant group because it specifically says we're native plants. Um, I think zinnias are very nice to have. And if I was going to choose to have an annual, you know, garden, I would probably go with them because they're easy to get. And you know they fulfill the purpose very well. Again, <laughs> pantas do. I mean, we use them in butterfly gardens. So yes, they attract butterflies. This is Brenda's picture. You can see hidden over here some kind of moth or butterfly coming um, for these pentas. They come in so many different varieties and colors, and um, they look great as that pop of color look nice in pots, look nice in the ground. So those are two annuals, you know, and pentas, you may say, I've had pentas more than one year. Sure, some of these, what we call annuals, may end up being perennials, but we call them short-lived short perennials. You're not gonna get four or five years out of them because they're gonna start getting really leggy 
and you know year after year just not not be what they once were. But pintas are fantastic to have around. Here's our classic impatience. The Florida friendly uh, landscape book doesn't mention them attracting any particular. Um, but they're only talking about butterflies and birds in the Florida friendly book. Like I said, it's being revised. So hopefully they're going to indicate when they attract other type of bees and other pollinators as well. But impatience, you know, classic annual. And I've had them come back year after year after year. Um, but they do get leggier um, each year. The book said dry soil, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, I know impatience. I grew up with impatience my entire life. They, they like it moist, but these are great pass along plants, aren't they? You just break a piece off, give it to their friend. They can either put it in water to grow the roots, which there are differing opinions on that. Some people say that's not, the, that's an adventitious root to survive in the water. It's not the same thing that it's gonna grow in the soil. So maybe you can do a test, put a piece in a glass of water, put another piece in some nice potting soil in a little pot, you know, see what you see if they both make it or if one does and one doesn't. Anyway, very, usually very easy to grow. These though, you want them in the shade for sure. They wanna be in the shade. And in this heat, what they will do is look like they're dying every single afternoon. Don't believe them. Go out in the morning and say, okay, Miss Diva Impatient, how are you feeling this morning? And if they're still wilted in the morning, then go ahead and water them. Otherwise, you're going to water them too much and they could end up dying on you. And of course, there's the New Guinea Impatients, there's the Double Impatients, all sorts to have great fun with. Folius is about the same, nice pass along plant. So many varieties of uh, polius. This particular one has this extremely long <laughs> Latin name for some of the varieties out there. And, you know, we can get them in different colors. Again, kind of reminds you of, you know, pass along plants, what your grandma's broke off and, and gave to you and put in a pot. Um, this particular Variety right there was actually developed at the University of Florida. So it is called Gator Glory. But we know there's dark purple, there's all kinds out there, and these are pretty easy to find too. And yeah, you'll say mine, mine come back year after year. They may, but they're not really promised to, we'll put it that way. Another one, Caladium, one of the few bulbs <laughs> that we can um, have a lot of success with here in Florida. Aside from um, great shelter for lizards to run around and hide in, things like that doesn't have a great amount of wildlife value, but it looks great. People like to put it under their trees. And oh my goodness, the different types of caladiums, there are hundreds of different varieties and that you can have fun with and play with colors. Well, here's another old standard. And because it hasn't, I mean, some, in some ways it's been hybridized, but not to the max. So the butterflies still recognize this as a plant that they should go to. Um, we were talking about mosquito control. A lot of people say, you know, marigolds um, keep mosquitoes away, maybe for a very short period of time is what Karen always tells me. Any of those plants that are um, touted as being mosquito repellents, maybe when you first put them there, but within a day or two, the mosquitoes get used to it. But these are great though, you know, for um, planting as a companion plant around your vegetables and things like that, because it does have maybe some repelling um, properties for some of the other type of insects out there. But it's just, you know, with their nice, Happy orange faces, a nice annual to, to have around, look particularly good in pots as well. All types of begonias, actually, I have highlighted the wax begonia, but again, a pass along plant, um, angel wing begonia. Everybody's grandmother has given them a piece of an angel wing begonia. Um, 
as well as the wax begonia and several of the others, you can keep them in a pot and probably keep them several years. Um, but you can also have them out as an annual, you know, to add to your the beauty of your annual bed as well. And the last one we're going to cover is the celosia or the, the rooster comb plants. Really cool looking. And I haven't seen these make any comebacks. You know, these are definitely annuals, but bring a nice pop of color um, into your yard and you can have a whole lot of fun with this as well. Now, these are by no means the only plants that you can grow in the summer here. We have oh, probably you know thousands of them. But I was just giving you an example of ones that beat the heat and usually do pretty well. Let's do a little tiny talk on your lawn. Um, just want to remind you, you're allowed to by ordinance right now in Hernando County, not in the Southern counties to fertilize, but you don't wanna over fertilize your lawn because too much nitrogen is going to create excessive growth. With all this rain we've been having, your lawn's not even gonna have a chance to get it. It's gonna end up in one of our waterways. If your you know, lawn is looking a little uh, anemic to you, you know, uh, you can get some, uh, do a foliar uh, liquid application of iron. That will actually help green up the leaves and not harm the environment. If you have bahia grass, one of the suggestions is to get some seed. Hard to do right now though, and it's expensive if you do, and just kind of spread it around like what happened naturally uh, where bahia grass grows in South America. The number one thing though I want you to know is to keep mowing it high. Keep it at three to four inches high. That is the key to a healthy lawn. You grow, you mow it lower, you are opening the door for many other problems. And here are your watering days. Since I do work for Hernando County uh, Utilities, here in Hernando County, we're under once a week watering restrictions. If your address ends in one, you may water before eight or after six on Mondays. I would suggest the early morning. Florida Friendly Landscaping would suggest early morning. You know what I really would suggest though? We've been getting an awful lot of rain. Please turn that irrigation system off. Go in your garage and turn that uh, clock, that irrigation clock off. You only need half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. How many inches of rain did you get yesterday and last night? Yeah. Let's turn that off for now. Mulch is a great way to help you in the summer to help keep moisture in the soil and also helps keep the soil um, a little cooler as well. You don't, we don't recommend cypress mulch, not because it's harmful to your yard, because it's an unsustainable practice. They are taking down young cypress trees just to shred up immediately and sell to us as mulch. We don't support that in Florida-friendly landscaping. And stay away from rocks unless it's just done decoratively um, in moderation and any artificial material as well. We talked a little bit about the impatience. Some of your other plants, maybe diva plants as well. My flyer bush likes to do this. And you need to ask it, okay, are you thirsty or are you just heat stressed? And so if you think it's thirsty, you may end up overwatering it. So the rule for all of these plants in this hot summer, in these afternoons, when they look like, I'm just dying. Um, what you wanna do is wait till morning, then go out and look at them. If they still look like this, go ahead and give them some more water. Don't think that's an issue right now. Nature has been giving us plenty of water in the last couple of days. Just a real short um, mention of that you can start thinking about your vegetable garden now. Summer's not a great time to grow one, but now you can start thinking about um, 
And here are the things that survived transplanting easily in central Florida where we are. Eggplant, endive, peppers, and tomatoes. Yay, it's time to start your tomatoes again. Um, if that may not may or may not be successful, careful transplanting our carrots. And you can start seeds now for your various beans, uh, okra, onions, green shallot, southern peas, black-eyed peas, and summer and winter squash. If you would like more, if you have more questions about vegetables, you need to contact Dr. Lester at the county extension office. Here, as I wrap up, is the absolute most important thing, though, I want you to remember. Lily's number one rule of all these things I'm telling you to remember about your yard and the flowers and everything, the number one rule is take care of the gardener. You are more important than anything out there in your yard. And there is very rarely, unless you have an irrigation leak or something like that, a yard emergency. It's hot. It is hot out there. Don't make yourself sick working out in the yard. Anything and everything can wait. And if you want to work in the yard, do it early morning, in the evening, exactly when Karen will tell you not to because of mosquitoes, but you know, just dress appropriately for those. So wear that mosquito repellent. Water, water, water. I want you as, um, because I work in water conservation, I want you to save water in the yard, but I don't want you to conserve water in yourself. <laughs> Drink, 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 drink a lot of water. Follow the shade in your yard. By that, I mean, if you start working in the morning, start in the shade, follow that shade as it moves along. If it, if it leaves your yard, then, then you're done. I would think by 9.30, 10, or whenever your body tells you, go inside, you're done anyway. Wear that loose, light colored clothing. Take lots of breaks, not a rush. Doesn't matter if company's coming, you know what? you're going to see, you are more of a critic of your yard than anybody else is. <laughs> you know, don't, don't push yourself for it. And wear that sunscreen and a hat. I just need you to take care of you or else who am I going to talk to? You know, that's how it goes. Here are some of the upcoming classes. Next week is the one I mentioned where I'm going to talk more about container gardening with the tiny gardens and a big impact tiny gardens can have if you only have a small space you only have a balcony, um, or even if you just want to learn, you know, more about it, join us next week at 10. And here are the others. If you are interested in how to find out um, how to get a rain barrel or a compost bin, if you're in Hernando County, first step for that is to email me so that I can give you instruction from there. It's lilyb at hernandocounty.us. And again, here's my email, my phone numbers, 352-540-6230. And um, I have a Facebook page. Obviously, it's probably how most of you found me, Fernando FFL program. And um, you can find all of these classes on Hernando County Government YouTube. I told you I would let you know about the nurseries that you, where you might be able to find some of these nice plants, the Hernando County Master Gardener Volunteer Nursery, they are volunteers, not the plants, um, is at 19490 Oliver, not Olive, Oliver Street in Brooksville, near Hernando County Animal Control. They're there Wednesdays and Saturdays, right now about 8.30 to 11. They work a little bit longer in, <laughs> in the fall and winter, but in the summer, you know, 11 is good enough. Also, um, I don't remember the exact address of the Nature Coast Botanical Gardens, but it is on Parker Avenue off of Spring Hill Drive in Spring Hill next to the fire station. Their nursery is open Monday and Saturday, I believe nine to noon. Their gardens are open all the time during daylight hours that you can stroll around. Best kept secret in Spring Hill. You want to go and check it out. You'll be, you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised how nice it is. 
And that is what I have for you this week. Karen, do you have anything else that you would like to share with us? There it's working. <laughs> yes. No, nope, just continue to dump and drain the standing water in your yard. Stay on top of it. These mosquitoes are looking for those pockets of water to lay their eggs. And if you need us, please give me a call. We'll be more than happy to send our guys out there to uh, treat whatever they're finding. And don't forget, we are not, we are still sending the truck. They're just not scheduled sprays. They need to be warranted. Okay. Oh, thank you very Happy much. Happy gardening. Let look, yes, let me look at this chat. Um, Brenda is telling us about her picture of the humistrata. Um, yeah, they're, we're not quite at the point yet where we can get them to grow in our yards. Um, that's just something that wants to grow in the wild. Hopefully, maybe as time goes by, they'll get you know more native milkweed for us to be able to grow in our yard. Um, Yes, uh, somebody asked if there are different Passiflora incarnata. I don't believe so. Um, it could be just that, um, well, maybe you have a non-native kind, I'm not sure. Um, maybe it was mismarked where you got it from. It says it doesn't attract anything uh, after two months planted. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a uh, a while for them to find it. And if you have the corky stem there, that could be just that they like it better. <laughs> That's why. And that could be why everyone is so excited about the corky stems. They're not as visually attractive to us, but they are way more attractive to the caterpillars. Therefore, that makes the butterfly enthusiasts enthused with the corky stem. So it could be just like a kid, you gave them something better. <laughs> so they're you know not as interested in the other. Maybe they'll come around eventually for the, um, the purple passion vine as well. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm reading some of these chats. Thank you, everybody. Um, somebody's asking, does adding a small bubbler, you must be from the Midwest, um, <laughs> small fountain pump um, into a bird bath prevent mosquito eggs from hatching, Karen? Yes. The mosquitoes only go in still water. So if you had a fountain going in there, yes, it definitely would prevent them from being yes. in there. That larvae needs to be able to breathe the oxygen from outside the water. So any moving water, they'll avoid. Okay. Okay. Um, Joy asked for the location of the uh, Master Gardener Nursery. I don't know if she heard me when I said it again, but I'll say it again. <laughs> 19490 Oliver Street in Brooksville. Um, cool. Somebody's asking about um, doing classes on gardening with horses. Um, that would not be my area, but I know someone. <laughs> Um, who could probably cover that. And I will mention to Dr. Lester, it's not him either. It's um, our agriculture extension agent, Laura. And I'll mention that, you know, people are asking about that. that that's a good topic there. All right, thank you everybody. And thank you, Karen, for joining us. Thank you for and having us. Yes, we will see you all again next week.